Hello, everyone. Hello, this is Rita. This is Amanda, and you're listening to I Don't Know Her, the podcast where we talk about women you've probably never heard of. But you should have, and today you will. <laughs> so it's a it's a heavy day today. It is. Um, it's hard. Uh, I think most people who are, I don't know, conscious and breathing... <laughs> know that what's going on right now is a lot of a lot of unrest because of yet another police officer killing yet another black man. Mm-hmm. And it's been a rough week. Um, there was another black man killed by a police officer, a trans man down in Florida, whose story has not gotten as much traction as George Floyd's. But I do want to bring up Tony McDade who was murdered by police officers and has been misgendered and dead named in the media ever since his murder. Oh my goodness. Which is yet another, like another layer of problematic framing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's one of those situations where we've talked about on here about the intersections. That's a huge one. (laughs) And so I, I have a friend who like specifically shouted out on Twitter, like, if I'm killed, please don't let them dead name me. Please don't let them oh, misgender me. And I was, it like broke my heart that they had to say that. Yeah. That's, I just, my, like I, before we started, I told Amanda, my soul hurts. It it really does. It's just, I, I don't, I can't wrap my head around that. This is still happening, that this is happening that this is the world that I live in and that my fellow, you know, minorities are scared. I don't like that. And what's wild is that this, this whole, this week really started with the situation with the white woman in Central Park. Yes. I watched that video. I want to resurrect for the moment the queen of caucasity. Here's your fucking crown. <laughs> that bitch took that fucking crown and ran with it. Yeah. There was a you know, there was a moment of watching that video where she looks him in the face and she says, "I'm going to call the police and tell them an African American man is threatening my life." The look on her face of I'm going to get you in trouble. AKA mm-hmm. I can get you shot. They're not going to listen to you. And she has that power and she knew it. And if I had the power to reach through a screen and fucking strangle somebody, I would, I know violence is not the answer, but it's hard not to be angry. That was, I, I kept telling Abby sh- cause she'd read the stories and I was like, no, 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 you need to watch the video. I'm not going to advocate for watching the video of, George Floyd being killed. And in fact, I'm going to actively ask people to stop sharing those kinds of things Mm -hmm. because if someone doesn't believe in black people's humanity, that that video is not going to be the thing that breaks through to them. Mm -hmm. But the video of Amy Cooper, queen of caucasity, threatening to call the police and then doing so and repeatedly saying, I'm uh, being threatened by an African-American man. There's an African-American man right here. There's an Mm African-American man. As if we didn't hear you the first time, bitch. Yeah. But second, she was using it as a weapon. Yes. She knew what the potential consequences were for cops coming to, by the way, a situation that didn't need to be escalated. No. He was bird watching. Her stupid dog was off leash. And she wasn't controlling it. And that's against the rules. Mm -hmm. That was the only reason that that shit escalated. And it was just so uh, frustrating. But I think it's very valuable. I think every white and white passing person in this country needs to watch that Amy Cooper video so that they can truly understand what people of color and specifically black people mean when they talk about white women weaponizing their womanhood and weaponizing their race Mm -hmm. and weaponizing their fragility. Exactly. It's wrong. And we have to be the ones to call that out. That can't be black people who've been trying to say it for hundreds of years. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, 
it's it's the responsibility of white and white passing people to call out white people especially white women absolutely um i i've been very disappointed with um personal people in my life on social media where they've been saying oh it's a terrible thing it should never have happened and this and this but and i'm like there is no but there is no there There's is no, no but. but and as soon as that goes into the rhetoric I'm like, you are already trying to make an excuse for it or give it a second look a look, or, or maybe, you know, this person, we don't know the whole situation. It's like, why do these people always get the second chance? And that guy is dead. Mm-hmm. Where's his second chance, you know? You know? And, and uh, they were, you know, the police in the case of George Floyd were called for a suspected forgery in progress. I don't remember needing to have weapons and lethal force for someone passing a bad check. Yeah. Which, by the way, turned out to not be even to be true. But even if it had been true, a death sentence is not the appropriate pun- punishment for a fucking bad check. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the other things that keeps getting sort of twisted is that, you know, like a lot of people, well-meaning people white and non-white we're sharing the stuff about chris cooper the bird watcher being such a great guy a harvard graduate member of the audubon society or board member of the audubon society and this uh he was a marvel comic book guy and he's a um big uh advocate in the gay community those are all great things but just like if there was another man in that situation with amy cooper in the park who was homeless and had face tattoos that doesn't make it like okay for him to have the cops called on him. Yeah. Like it's it, there that model minority bullshit needs to go away. Like everybody has a right to their life. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Regardless of what they look like or their past or their indiscretions. Yep. Like we don't get to take someone's life from them because we don't like the way they look or because they their race is the thing we decide determines their ability to stay alive. It's just, we have to stop passing around this idea that there's a good kind of black person. Mm -hmm. It's not, that's not going to stop cops. They don't give a shit. Yeah. And clearly it's not going to stop Queens of Caucasity like Amy Cooper. (laughs) She should move to Idaho. (laughs) Yeah. Like we need more of them. Yeah. She should move to outer space. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And, you know, you know, people really felt sad for her because she lost her job and her dog was repossessed by the shelter that she had adopted from. And I was like, that that woman made choices, right? Like you saw it in her face and in her voice. She had made a choice knowing she was on film to call the police and lie about the situation Mm -hmm. To put a black man in danger on purpose. The least that could happen to her is she has to get a new job and adopt a new dog. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. She she didn't lose her life. Yeah. Or get arrested or have charges pressed against her. I know. She should have been charged with a crime. I think so, too. supporting. I think um, definitely the more and more that... uh, hopefully that we see that these people are arrested, that there are consequences. It might start getting people to, to stop and think before they do something like that. I think honestly, it's this pressure from social media that ends up being the reason why people do get in trouble for those kinds of actions. It's not because of the police for sure. It's not because of the law. Mm -hmm. It's because there is pressure being put on, by fellow citizens who recognize how wrong and not okay the situation is, which is why I think it's really important for all of us to continue to have these conversations and be aware of what's happening around us. And, and especially for white and white passing people to call in your folks and tell them what the story is yeah, and help them be better white people. Mm -hmm. Like it's, that is incumbent upon white people to do and not anyone else. 
So in that vein, I want to say that one of our summer plans is to revamp our website. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make a page on our website that's going to have a running updated list of resources for white people and especially white women to go on and find ways that they can help themselves become better allies Mm -hmm. um, and anti-racist resources and ways to help with actually changing things. That's awesome. Racism, man. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Fuck it. Slap your local racist, y'all. I made a post today that I just said, like, even very good white people, (laughs) like myself, who want to be good, just because we have good intentions does not mean we are not racist and that we don't have the ability to be racist. Mm -hmm. Every single person in this country, regardless of their race was raised in institutional racism and it pervades every part of our society every day of our lives. And so, yeah, even very good white people are racist because you can't not be (laughs) because that's the way we have been like raised and born and bred. So the only way you can really move forward is to recognize that and to spend time learning and listening, and reading, and understanding, and then recognizing when you are thinking a thought, behaving a way, saying a thing, and then calling yourself out, and trying to do better next time, Mm -hmm. and then doing that practice with the people around you. Definitely. Those are excellent steps to take. I don't know what to say next now. (laughs) Me neither. I'm at a loss with this. I just, I am... I don't want to say it, but I feel like just giving up a little bit of just, it's never going to change. Well, and I think for you, you are absolutely welcome to hang up, hang up the cape. (laughs) You can't do it anymore. You're tired. Yeah. I'm tired too, but it's not the same. And I know that. And it is frustrating and it's rage inducing and I feel I feel helpless. And I think that's why it's important to have resources out there that people can tap into that helps them feel like they've, they can do something about it without overextending their own sanity. Yeah. And I'm just very fearful of raising a a brown boy in this world. Uh, I had a friend who is, she's uh, native American she had a group of other natives that had gathered to work on a project outdoors and she had a rifle because she was picking off marmots that eat their garden. And she for a second was going to give him the shotgun to teach him how to aim and shoot. And then she changed her mind because she said, I'm not going to give this Brown boy a gun in public because who knows what the heck could possibly happen to him. Somebody could call the police on him and he could potentially be shot and killed. Um, Then I had another friend that uh, he's white and had his two white sons with him and they were out shooting and two uh, officers who were patrolling the grounds came out and they just asked, are these guns registered? And he said, yep. And they're like, okay, cool. And you know, his sons had the guns and they were shooting, had a grand old time. It's situations like that, you know. He didn't even think twice about being out in public with his two sons. He didn't have that fear. He doesn't have that fleeting thought of, oh, shoot, this could end up bad, you know. Yeah. It's situations like that where we have to hold ourselves back because there's a potential that we could get hurt or killed, misunderstood. I uh... I thought of when you talked about Isai, you know, even if he's learning to responsibly shoot, what have you, um, you know, Tavir Rice was 12 years old when he was murdered Mm -hmm. because he had a toy gun in his hand. Yeah. Like you can't even, can't even carry a toy gun. No. (laughs) Let alone a real one. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we really need to take a good hard look at not only the thoughts that perpetuate our our country, but also our our systems. And as I wrote in my post on Facebook, 
policing in this country was designed to be racist. That's what it was. It was yes. designed in and of racism. And it will never change. So we have to have a good hard look at that. And what are we going to, if we ever, ever want to actually address the problem of institutional racism in our country, we need to take a look at how we're going to reform or abolish police altogether. Mm. Definitely. We were talking today uh, about how uncomfortable and like scared and fearful uh, my wife and I and our son are if we're like driving and there's a police officer around. And my wife made the comment, like, that's not how you should feel when somebody is supposedly protecting you. Mm -hmm. And I said, said, the reason why we all three feel that way, and that, again, that fear is one iota of the fear that you have and that black people, especially black men, have. That fear is because they are not protecting. They are policing. Mm -hmm. And there is a huge difference. You can hand out tickets and keep the peace without a gun. Yeah. Oh, well, moving on to yeah. a lighter note, because we don't want to start this way, way too heavy. But, you know, we are speaking tr- our truths. Um, we'd like to give a little shout out to somebody who has helped us. <laughs> yeah, it's been a really great supporter. She recently came on as a listener. Um, and that is booktuber extraordinaire Amy Myers. She has her own YouTube channel. I highly recommend you check it out. It's very whimsical and fun. And if you're into books and feminism, I think you'll enjoy her YouTube show. Um, Again, it's under her name, which is Amy Myers, M-Y-E-R-S. A-M-Y is her first name. Really easy to find. And she did a great little shout out for us of her favorite things that she's been partaking in during the pandemic. And she listed us. She doesn't even like podcasts, so that's cool. <laughs> I, I like that, too, that she's like, I don't listen to podcasts, but if you're going to listen to one, listen to this one. So thank you so much, Amy. We do appreciate that. She also does have an Instagram, which is called The Nonfiction Feminist. Yeah, and Twitter as well. <laughs> <laughs> so she is everywhere. You'll find her. Uh, so thank you, Amy, for the shout outs and everybody else who's been listening. And uh, we have good news, I think, but maybe not great news for everybody. We are going to be rounding out our second season with 40 episodes. You're listening currently to episode 38. So we'll have two more after this one. And then we're going to be doing some cool stuff over the summer. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to revamp our website. Hopefully also that means we'll have our store up and running and Uh, We'd like to release some bonus material throughout the summer. So make sure you're still subscribed and checking your podcasts to see new bonus material throughout the summer. And then we'll come back in August with new episodes and new women. Yeah. And while we are taking that hiatus, it's a good time to catch up on those episodes that you missed out on. There's some funny ones out there. Yeah. And by this point, I mean, 40. Yeah, we'll have 65 total episodes for you. So there's a lot to listen to. (laughs) Who was first last time? Was it uh, me? It was you with uh, Marie St. Clair. I did, however. Stephanie, I, Stephanie so, St. Clair. Stephanie St. Clair. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, I looked up that rejected princesses image that you told me about. I loved it. With bu- it's so cool. Bumpies in the back, like all big and the guy with the turban. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was a really funny photo, but very well done. I love that site. It was good. So I think that means you're, you're first. Have you ever heard of Sarah Biffin? Griffin? Biffin with a B. No, I don't know her. Sarah is the artist with no arms. Oh. Yes. Wow. Um, I do want to preface this episode where um, I was researching Sarah and parts of her story get a little uncomfortable because it is a person who is disabled that is being taken advantage of which um, I feel is like one of the worst things that you could ever do. It's somebody who's already struggling through life physically, doesn't need people taking advantage of them. Um, Yeah. It made me really uncomfortable. So I apologize if it makes other people uncomfortable, but I feel like Sarah's story still needs to be shared despite that because we all go through things that are not always so comfortable. So Sarah Biffin was born in 1798 to a family of farmers in East Quantock's head, Somerset. Hopefully I said that right. <laughs> and you said 1798. What? 
I thought this was going to be someone super recent. So I was like getting ready for like a 1985. <laughs> no, this was not it. 1798. She was born with what's called focomelia, which affects the development of limb and bone in utero. As a result, she was born with no arms and vestigial legs. And vestigial is that they they stop growing at infancy. So as she became an adult, they stayed the same size. Oh. Her family did not have the greatest response to her handicap. They treated her like she was made of glass. They thought she was she was going to break if they touched her. They would rarely let her go out because they didn't want people to stare at her, talk about her. And they always were doing things for her. They didn't want her to be um, independent. In my research, I found this note, like this one mention of this. I didn't find it in anything else. So I'm not sure if this is real or not. But it said that the only reason that she survived her infancy, infancy because of an intervention of a clergyman. So I don't know what that meant. I didn't know if her family was going to get rid of her. Jeez. Yeah. It's fucking intense. Although I, I guess, I guess at the time there, there were a lot of people that thought that was what she was, you know, that, that was an acceptable behavior. Exactly. Which is terrible. Uh, This treatment only made Sarah more headstrong and she pushed herself to do more things, more things for herself and more things that they thought she was capable of. She learned to read. And when her parents were out tending the farm, Sarah secretly and amazingly taught herself how to sew with her mouth. Whoa. Yes. She would practice for hours. And by the age of eight years old, she could thread a needle. She could sew. She could tie a knot and she could use scissors. With her mouth? With her mouth. I'm just like, I guess those people who can tie cherry stems with their tongue, maybe that's how they, how, how, how she could like she could thread a needle. Maneuver, yeah. Like that's wild. She even got so good that she started making her own dresses. Wow. And she shocked her parents with that one. Like they did not realize what she was capable of. And as she got older, <laughs> she started to practice and teach herself how to write with her mouth. See, like at least I understand like, you can like control a pencil, but I'm still stuck on the fucking needle and thread. I can barely how thread a needle with my my two hands. It's difficult. Um, I yeah, I don't. I can't do it well. Like I have to, I have to have it up in the light. I have to, I have to like lick everything. <laughs> <laughs> she did like use other objects to like push up against. So I'm wondering if she yeah. like stuck the needle in her desk and used used it that way, but it didn't elaborate on how she was able to do that. It doesn't matter really. It's just the fact that she can do it is incredible. Yes. So she ended up sewing onto the four forward front of her dress, like on the shoulder, little loops of fabric that she could thread her pencils through and like her scissors and stuff. So she could push her shoulder up to her mouth and be able to pull her utensils out. Oh, that's so smart. Her life changed when she was around 14 years old. Her family meets a man named Emmanuel Dukes. And Dukes says that he has a way that their daughter can make money. He ran a fair sideshow. Oh, of course. Yes. And he traveled throughout England. He said that he had a background in art and he could teach her to paint and manage her and help support her. What he would do is he would have people pay money to demonstrate how she could sew, how she drew, and maybe even draw people's portraits. And obviously, like, I I don't like this guy. <laughs> I don't like what he's well, doing. It's really upsetting to me when people, like, she's a human being who's doing normal ass shit. It's not like she's doing anything spectacular. What's spectacular is that she has compensated for something that is is an obstacle Mm -hmm. but that doesn't make her a freak show or a sideshow or whatever this guy thinks she is exactly it's not really known if the decision to leave with dukes was sarah's or her parents it's kind of more on the side of it was probably her family thinking that they didn't want to take care of her for the rest of their lives 
Mm. She ended up leaving with Dukes either way. So Dukes did teach her how to paint, which he gladly took credit for. He said that he opened and tapped into a wonderful talent. So he's taking all the credit for teaching her. (sighs) And for years, she worked for him. He charged money for people to come see her, purchase small portraits that she had painted. And while she's working for him, though, she is taking time to hone in her skill as a painter. She started drawing landscapes. She painted portraits, um, like little miniatures on ivory, which she would then put into gold trim and make them into necklaces that people could wear. Her artwork was really small, too. So her canvases were only about four by four inches because of the range that her neck had. Oh, that makes more sense. I was like, it feels, when I thought about it, I thought it would be harder to paint on a smaller canvas, but yeah, it would make sense that you would want a smaller canvas. Even though they were small, though, they were really delicately detailed and her portraits were very lifelike. Like she was able to do so much on this tiny canvas that these people, like the portraits that I saw that she did of people, it was super realistic. Like the flush in the cheeks and the look in the eyes, the details of the hair. Like she was a fantastic artist. Oh my God, I can't wait to see her work. So the money's coming in through admission fees, the painting sales, her demos, and it's all going into Duke's pocket. And how much do you think he paid Sarah for every year? Are we talking like a man, like twenty nineteen dollars? We're talking pounds. We're talking pounds. <laughs> oh, I don't. I don't even know what pounds were worth <laughs> back then. But I'm gonna say a half a pound. He paid her five pounds a year. A year. A year. Okay, Lucas. I'm gonna ask for a little window into what that would look like now. How little was he paying her in American dollars before we went into a giant depression? a la COVID. (laughs) Five pounds in 1812 was the equivalent of 358 pounds today. The exchange rate today is 1.25, which translates to $447.50. So when I say that she worked for Duke for years, she worked for for, for him for 16 years. Oh my God. Yeah. Until one day things changed for her. While working at the fair, she caught the attention of a man named the Earl of Morton. He was impressed with her talent and loved her incredibly detailed pieces. So he offered to sponsor her to be able to receive lessons from a Royal Academy of Arts painter named William Craig. And she was like, heck yeah, like, let's do this. So she ends up packing up and she leaves Dukes behind. He's pissed, too. He just sees that (laughs) bye-bye, you know, all of that freaking money that he was scamming her out of. I'm just a little nervous because it's yet again another man who's like, I can help you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, apprenticing under William Craig, she perfected her pieces. She actually was recognized by the Royal Society of Arts for her work. And that was a big deal because this organization was created to support the arts community. And they actually had a huge push for social change. The society awarded her with a medal in 1821 for a historical miniature that she painted and decided to accept a few of her paintings to be in the permanent collection of the Royal Academy. Wow. So you said she was with this, that, Circus guy for 16 years. Yes. So how how old was she when she was when she entered the circus? She was around 14. My god, she was so young. She was young. Some said 13, some said 14, so I, f- I feel like it was in that range, but she was a very young girl. So now she's in like her young like young 30s, like she's in yeah. her low 30s, I, right? She's about 30, 31 years old. Yeah, wow. That's a long time. (laughs) It's a long time, but it's a lot of success to reach at a fairly young age. Yeah, true. So after winning this medal, Sarah was commissioned by the royal family to paint all of their portraits, which is a big fucking deal. 
<laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> like the king wants you to paint his portrait. Holy shit. So she privately painted prestigious royals such as Queen Victoria, Prince Albert, King George III, and many more of their family. Wow. And she became the artist to be painted by. She was socializing with pretty prestigious social circles. Uh, Charles Dickens even mentions her in a few of his writings, uh, one in the famous book, Nicholas Nickleby. And after being commissioned by the royal family and being sponsored still by the Earl of Morton, she was able to set up her own studio on Bond Street in London. And that there she created like her own workspace. That was her own private studio. She was also established as the official artist in the court of the King of Holland, which I don't know. Oh. Yeah. So she's hanging out with like all of these international people. So she's getting work from all different sides. Yeah. All over Europe. It yeah. sounds like. Sarah's life was now what she had always wanted. It was her own. Um, but things took a turn again for her and in not such oh, a great no. way. Yes. Uh, things got bad when she married a man named William Wright. The marriage was not a good one, and they split up within a year. Uh, Sarah was devastated, and to make it worse, there were rumors that William had taken all of her money. Oh, no. Things got even worse when the Earl of Morton died. Her commissions were not coming in like they used to be, and so she no longer had a sponsor either. So she was running out of money very quickly. So she did end up going back to what she knew. She went back to working at the fairs. She did not go back to Dukes. I'll say that. Well, yeah, at least there's one saving grace. But still, like, to have been, like, the royal painter and now you're back as, like, a circus sideshow, that is yeah. awful. So at this point, her most loyal patrons and Queen Victoria, they step in and intervene. Queen Victoria awards her what they call a civil list pension. And it's mm. it's an allotment every month that she was able to live on and be able to not do the fairs and have her own her own life. That's great. She was able to comfortably retire to a private life in Liverpool, which she did until she died on October 2nd in 1850. She was only 66 years old. Yeah, that's pretty young. In documents found after Sarah's death, she writes in there that she felt both Dukes and her ex-husband had done the best they could by her, that she had no ill will towards them at all. And that irked me that's, a little bit because... It's like that, yeah, like, that's okay. I got enough ill will towards them for, just for, for you. <laughs> it, it did kind of get under my skin because of course in my own eyes these men did take advantage of her but her stating that it did that she had no ill will i was wondering if she was trying to just close the book on those chapters in her life and be at peace with it and not not let it take her down yeah it's hard to say i mean i also wonder if she was just trying to be like socially like following social norms or something you know in all the research I did, there were a few self-portraits that she did of herself in her face. Uh, in this one self-portrait that kept showing up in a lot of the research that I did, her face is very warm, but it's got a strong look. And her eyes are just like, like I said, she was really good with painting eyes. They're like filled with light and life. And she's got like this tiniest little smirk on her face. And it looks really dignified and almost triumphant, like she had like she had won something. I love that. Like when there's that like Mona Lisa thing. Yeah. She knows something <laughs> that the rest of us don't. There's a miniature specialist. Her name is Emma Rutherford. And she says that people comment on that portrait all the time and that they always focus on her face. In the portrait, they later on notice that her sleeves are sewn up. And so she feels like that's what Sarah would have wanted. They would want them to see her first and her disability second. Of course. People are not their disability. People are people. Exactly. So I think with all the hardships that she had in her life, she was determined not to let those define who she was. 
And her work is in galleries and in private collections all over Europe. She has paintings that are still actually being auctioned off even now. Ooh, that's neat. Yeah. In 2019, one of her portraits of the royal family sold at Sotheby's for 1,300, wait, 137,000 pounds. Whoa. Yeah. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of dough. (laughs) So I got all of my information from this wonderful article by Emma Rutherford that I had mentioned before. She's a miniature specialist. Uh, The article's called Who is Sarah Biffin? And then a blog called Sarah Biffin, Small Artist Makes a Big Impact by Recollections nationalgalleries.org she does have a rejected princesses which is awesome Mm -hmm. and wikipedia and you said that first article by emma rather rutherford rutherford and where was that at that is called who i got the title title i didn't write the website that it was on oh (laughs) i was like did i miss that (laughs) and that's That's her Yeah, I really found her story. You know, she did struggle, but she always seemed to just not let it get her down. I mean, she's already had this big thing that has affected her life and to have more piled on and still come out with the grace and the dignity that she had. I found it quite beautiful. Yeah, impressive. I'm also, I really can't wait to see her paintings and I can't wait for our listeners to go on Instagram or Facebook and take a look too, Mm. because that's going to be the coolest part is to be able to see what she made. So who do you have today? Well, I have a creator as well. Oh, yes. I love it. I love when we're on the same thread. (laughs) And uh, again, you're going to have to just all bear with me with my terrible French. I have a friend who is a French teacher who I made send me audio of all of these names, and I know I'm still not going to do it right, but I'm going to do my best. Cheers to your effort. Okay. Do you know who Jeanne Pacquion is? No, but we have another Jeanne. I know. (laughs) Um, She was the first woman to become a major professional fashion designer. Oh, okay. Yeah, I went totally different. Yeah, I love I love me some fashion. <laughs> me too. I really do love fashion. I and the, I think the reason why this came to me is because this this week when I was talking to my therapist, I was talking a lot about how my clothes that that I can never get the clothes that I want that I envision in my head that I should be wearing because they don't fit what my body currently looks like mm. and how that is contributing to my body dysphoria. And so um, I was really like just thinking about that a lot about fashion and fashion design and how a lot of people like think it's frivolous. But when you think about it, it's like that's that's an extension of our inner selves that we're showing to the outside world. And Mm -hmm. it is really important. So I thought, I wonder who that first woman was who became a professional designer, because most professional designers are men. Yes. So I'm going to tell you about Jean (laughs) Pacquion. Jean-Marie Charlotte Beckers was born in 1869 on the outskirts of Paris. Her father was a physician and they had a fairly well-to-do life. Seemed like that was, they were, they were pretty well off. Uh, She was one of five children. And I guess it was really customary at the time that like at a young age, like 13, 14, uh, teens would be sent out to apprentice and work in like, potential career paths okay so she uh was working as a seamstress at a neighborhood dressmaker and she quickly showed immediately that she was very talented at dressmaking and she ended up being hired at the ground level as a dressmaker at maison roof which was <laughs> one of paris's premier fashion houses at the time which eventually would be run by a woman but was um run by a fa- it was like a man who had started it and his family eventually ran it. So at Maison Roof, J- uh, Jean proved to be not just talented at dressmaking, but also at designing. Mm. And she rapidly moved up the ranks at the fashion house to become the premier 
(laughs) (laughs) Which meant that she was in charge of the atelier, which is where they actually made the clothes. So she was in charge of the entire shop that makes all the clothing. That's awesome. And in 19, or sorry, in 1891, Jean married a man named Isidore René Jacob de Pacion. Whoa, that's a mouthful. <laughs> he was a businessman and a banker, and he owned a couture shop called Pacion Lalan. And once they got married, the couple decided to run the business together and they renamed it just Pacion. The way in which they ran their fashion house was very different from what other people were doing at the time. Normally, the husbands were the head designers, obviously, Mm. and the wives were muses or models, and that was the extent to their involvement in the operation. They had no say in designs. They had no say in operations of the business. They were just supposed to be the pretty girls who wore the clothes. Okay. But in the case of Paquion... Jeanne was the primary designer and her husband ran the business side of things. And it was a full 50-50 partnership. Did they let people know that it was 50-50? Like she didn't have to hide it? Yeah, everybody knew. Oh, that's cool. So the Paquions opened their shop at 3 Rue de la Paix in Paris, which was one of the most glamorous, chic areas in the city. It was where all of the couture gowns were. That's where like the rich and famous would go to get their fashion. And it was very exclusive. In fact, the Pacquions were next door to the house of worth. (laughs) Oh, I love how they, everything's like a house, a house of this, a house of that. Yes. That's what Maison is, the house, right? (laughs) So they were next to the house of worth, which was the design house of Charles Frederick worth, who had originally been, was born in Britain, but became a French fashion designer. He is known as the first modern couturier. So he was the first person to make couture clothing. His success as a designer had completely wiped out female dressmakers in Paris. Like they no longer could have their own names. It was all Charles Worth and his dressmakers. So female dressmakers were like just tossed to the side. Whoa. So, with Jean Pacquion's arrival on the scene, that would change. At the end of the 1800s and into the early 1900s, pastel colors were all the rage in fashion. So, they would have these, like, pastel pink, like, silk gowns with, like, a little pastel green on the side. It reminds me of, like, that moment in the 90s when pastel was all the rage. Oh, yeah. Do you remember when everybody was wearing like pastel and satin? (laughs) Yeah. And we, but remember our nails, we would always have like, you know, Robin's egg blue nails. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's so funny. And like sherbet, pastel pink, the yellow, that pale yellow color. So that was what she had come in on. And it was, was not very innovative to use those colors. Everybody was using them and they were kind of falling out of fashion a little bit. And she used those in all of her early designs, but eventually she became really drawn to the color black, which was at the time not used in everyday fashion at all. And Pacquion began to incorporate black into her designs and often she would have like an entirely black dress, but she would accent it with color, like in a silk lining of a coat might be like a really bright jewel blue. Hmm. Um, Or she would do embroidery and the embroidery would be red because that's another color she became really enamored with was like a scarlet red, which was yet another color that nobody used. Red and black were like not it. Yeah. In fact, black was reserved entirely for like funeral clothing or mourning, like to show you were in a period of mourning. So it was pretty it was pretty out there that she started doing clothing in black. She also would like to play with textures a lot. So we're really familiar now in fashion with the the push and pull of hard and soft, right? Mm-hmm. Like you might pair a leather jacket with a pretty flowy dress underneath, right? Mm-hmm. So she was basically the first person who did that. Wow. Instead of pairing things that were expected, like for instance, if you were going to get a 
a wool overcoat. It might have a fur trim lining. That seems pretty standard. Yeah. So she would take fur and put it on like a flowy gown. (laughs) Interesting. Which had not ever been done. And in fact, I want to show you a couple of different designs while we're while we're recording so you can I just I want to see your reaction to them because some of them okay. are wild. Some of the <laughs> things that she made were really wild. Um she would actually sometimes put like fur collar, like or fur lining on an entire full length silk evening gown. Wow. And she also would like mix lace with silk or chiffon with crocheted pieces. So you really had just two com- wildly different textiles mm-hmm. that were generally used for totally different purposes. How mixed exciting, into one though. garment. Yeah, it is really cool. So I'm going to pull something up and show it to you via my screen. Okay, so the first one I want to show you, this is what I was talking about with the pastels. This is what she originally started designing. Okay. So it's very, like, pretty, very ladylike. Yeah. Right? But then she started using a lot more black. And this is another one that's got pastel in it. But look at that embroidery. Yeah. Looks very delicate. Isn't that incredible? Yeah, I'm in love with some of the stuff she designed. There's this dress I thought was on this page, but it might not be. And I wanted to show it to you. Yeah, yeah, it's at the it's at the Met. So I want to go to that. So the Met Museum in New York has some of her stuff on 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 display there. So Rita, why don't you explain what this dress looks like? It looks like a bird. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean like in a in a beautiful way like the it's is that fur or those feathers? So it says in the description that it's monkey fur. Whoa. Oh my gosh. Right? So what this is, is like all the way down the dress. So it has like a sweetheart neckline at the top. And it has this really wispy black fur lining that sweetheart neckline. And then when the skirt starts, it's basically like lining the seams that would go down the panels you see this really wispy black fur all the way down and at first i thought it looked really weird but then the more i looked at it i thought wow it's actually quite beautiful it's very different from from what you showed me to what was being designed earlier to this yeah the stuff that was earlier was very precious i would say like It's like pastel pink and silky with great embroidery and like everything is very covered. Yeah. Women were quite covered. And then this dress is like spaghetti strap, sweetheart neckline, monkey fur. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely out there. So what truly defined what she made, though, which was cool, is that Pacquion's designs were wearable. So many of the male designers at the time invented clothes that looked great on a mannequin, but were completely unwearable on real women. Oh, I can believe that. <laughs> and Pacquion was a really fashionable woman herself. Like, she was always dressed to the nines wherever she went. And of course, she had this wealthy husband, so she could do that. Yeah. And But she wanted her clothes to be practical that women could actually wear. So I'm going to also show you one other uh, design. Have you ever heard of a hobble skirt? No. Hobble skirt. Yes, a hobble skirt. So I'm going to pull up a picture. I know hobbling is like when you're about to fall over. (laughs) Yes, and there's a reason why it's called the hobble skirt. And the hobble skirt um, is still around. Like a lot of people, I think, think it's not. So I'm going to open up this image and then I'll show it to you. I hope that all of these clicks cannot be heard on the podcast, but if they are, they are. Okay, I'm going to share this screen. So this is a hobble skirt. Uh, No, thank you. So explain what it is. It is like super tight from the knee down to the ankle where it looks like you can't move, like you're bound. And then kind of as the knee to the waist, it's, it's bowed out a little bit. 
Yeah, and they used to be even more exaggerated, like this one right here, which is this pink number, where it literally looks like somebody tied a band below the knee, and above that is like this big bubble. And so these were super duper popular at the time, and they were uh, designed by a guy named uh, Paul Prore. And Paul Prore made this hobble skirt that became very fashionable, but it was not functional. Like women were constantly, literally hobbling, right? They couldn't yeah. walk normally. And they would fall a lot. Yeah, I can imagine. I would be one of those women. <laughs> Remember when we talked about that, um, our our first drag king? Yeah. And how when he first started out, or when she first started out, she would switch characters between women and men. This was one of the things she would make fun of when she made fun of women. Oh, shit. <laughs> she would wear the hobble skirt to make fun of these clothes. That's crazy. So, and, and I just want to point out that hobble skirts still exist. They just look different than we saw them in the past. But like mm-hmm. those super body con <laughs> dresses that go all the way down and at the, at the feet, it's just, it's just gets tighter and tighter. Mm-hmm. Those are hobble skirts too. Yikes. So she was like, I'm not going to, she, she wanted to, to make a hobble skirt just to spite this guy, Paul Pere. So she um, added invisible pleats that allowed the wearer to walk in it while still looking like a hobble skirt. Interesting. Yeah. Functionality. So her clothes were not, most of the time, not terribly adventurous. They were usually pretty, like, just beautiful, wearable clothing. She did create some new styles. One of the things she did was she invented the idea of a day to evening look. Oh, something nice. that you could wear the whole day. And what it was is a tailored dress that had soft draping that could be worn at like something like an afternoon tea or when you're accompanying your husband to go to golf or whatever. And then you could still transition into an evening event like a night out or a, a ball or something like that. Which I thought was cool that she invented the day to evening look. <laughs> yeah. As Jean Pacquion designed clothes, her husband was courting clients. And they both had a pretty impeccable eye for business. And they decided to make their clothing available to anyone who could afford it. So that was quite different from the other Paris fashion houses, which were all closed. You could only go there by appointment only and only if they knew who you were. Oh, jeez. So this is what the Paris guidebook said about the Pacquion house. From the first, this clever and ornamental young couple followed a new system. No haughty seclusion, no barred doors at the Maison Pacquion. That's really neat. Yeah, like literally the other couture houses had like bars everywhere. Like they would, they didn't let anybody in because they didn't want you to come in if you weren't their kind of person. Yeah. <laughs> and the Pacquions were like, no, we want everybody to come in if, you, you know, their their clothes were no by no means affordable, but they were more affordable than the other houses. Mm-hmm. And they were open door policies. So Pacquions clientele included the queens of Spain, Portugal, and Belgium, as well as the daughters of wealthy businessmen or socialites mm-hmm. or actresses. So that meant that if you went to visit the house of Pacquion, you could be the queen of Spain in a dressing room trying on a dress next door to just, a, you know, just some everyday girl. That's crazy. <laughs> who's trying on the dress. <laughs> yeah. So another way in which their business became more profitable than some of the others is that Jean saw opportunities to advertise her dresses and her designs in ways that no other designer was doing at the time. She would put her dresses on models, sometimes even the same dress on multiple different models, and then she would send them out to popular events. Like they would go to the opera wearing her dress. They would go to racehorse, like races to go wear her dress. Yeah. And that, like, that's the kind of stuff that, like, you know, whenever you see actresses at the Oscars, right? They don't Who own those wearing? dresses. Who are you Who wearing? Who are you wearing? Who are you wearing? I'm wearing Oscar de la Renta. Well, these models would go out and people would be 
oh my god that's a beautiful gown where did you get it oh it's mm -hmm. from the house of pacione <laughs> So within days, new and old customers alike would bombard her shop looking to have one of the dresses made for themselves. And unlike many other designers of the day who absolutely didn't want anything to do with the theater, because remember we've talked about how theater could be seen as one way or the other? Yeah. Jean Paquin, Paquion often designed for actresses, so she was one of the very first designers who ever put actresses in custom design clothes. In fact, in her store... She even had a stage build inside the shop and it even had like the little footlights that come up at the bottom of the stage so that the actresses could see what their garments would look like when they're on stage. Oh, that's cool. So as if Jean Paquion and her husband hadn't already proven that they were pretty shrewd business people, Jean opened a full branch of their fashion house, including an atelier in London in 1896, making them the first fashion house to do so. In 1900, she was one of the central organizers of the Exposition Universelle, or what was known as the World's Expo in Paris. Ooh. And we've all heard of the World's Expo. Like, we yeah, know it's a big deal. That's a big deal. So at this expo in Paris, she was designated the president of the fashion section. And that elevated her immediately to the top of the Paris fashion scene and therefore the fashion scene across the globe. Yeah. I bet that pissed off some people. <laughs> like Paul Poiret. <laughs> yeah. Inventor of the hobble skirt. <laughs> so Jean Paquion's brand skyrocketed, but tragedy struck in 1907. Oh, no. When Jean's husband, Isidore, fell ill and died suddenly was very unexpected. Wow. He was only 45 years old. Did it say what he passed away from? No, that he just fell ill ex unexpectedly and died. Mm -hmm. At the time, Jean was just 38 years old. Oh, that's so young to lose your partner. Yeah, and like they were, from all accounts, very, very great partnership that they gave equally to each other and endured each other. Uh, and it was reported that more than 2,000 people attended his funeral. So Ooh. he seemed to have touched a lot of people. Yeah. After her husband's death, Jeanne used the business to distract herself from grief and fully immersed herself in the fashion house. She also stopped dressing in color, preferring only to be dressed in black and white, which was very unusual for women of the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, in his memory, she created an award to recognize artists, and she often collaborated with the artists on their on designs for the house, which was also something completely different and unique. Like mm -hmm. she would take painters and give them, an, you know, she would award a painter this. It was called like the Pachyon Prix or Prix of Pachyon, and when she would award these artists, she would also be like hey i like your designs why don't we work together on a dress mm, that's really neat which nobody had done before those kinds of collabs so a year later after her husband died she started to incorporate tailoring into the business for the first time and that is what elevated the pacquion brand into a what was considered a full fashion house so her fashion house included couture gowns lingerie, accessories, furs, etc. Mm -hmm. A few years after her husband's death, um, she knew that the business was a little too much for her to handle by herself. So she brought on her half-brother and his wife as partners. And he was already pretty well known because he was uh, a man, he made furs, he designed furs. Oh, okay. And it made sense then for them to partner because she was pretty well known for using fur in a lot of her designs. Mm -hmm. The first venture they started together was a fur shop on Fifth Avenue in New York City. We all know that Fifth Avenue is like uh, the, the place. place. <laughs> <laughs> and within a few years, there was a branch of Pacquion in London, New York, Buenos Aires, and Madrid. Wow. So not only did she have a pretty wise eye for business, Jeanne was also well known for having a fairly enlightened view about workers and labor at the time. 
She even purchased a villa for her employees to use for what? relaxation. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I want to work for that lady. I know, me too. I was like, Give I want to go villa. on French. <laughs> it was like on the Riviera villa. Oh gosh. Well, when people are comfortable, they can create way better. Why did you think bands go and get a house somewhere or a cabin to create an album? Right. It's and like what a great thing to offer. Like I'm gonna buy this villa not for me but for you. Mm-hmm. And during a huge worker strike in France, when the entire couture industry was jeopardized, when all of these seamstresses and stuff went on strike, instead of expressing anger at the workers, she publicly expressed sympathy for them, and that angered many of her fellow couturiers who did not believe in the worker strike. At the height of her success, she employed more than 2,000 people. One source I read said her company had 2,700 people working in it at its peak. Oh my goodness. That's quite a lot of people, especially for the time. (laughs) And all they're doing is making gowns. So you can like, or clothing, you know, so you can like understand. And it's couture clothing. It's not, it's not like you're going to get a t-shirt. This is yeah. Very expensive clothing. And to be employing that many people means that she was very popular. Mm-hmm. And she's bringing in the money, too. Oh, very much. So not everything, obviously, was going to be sunshine and rainbows. She and fellow designer Paul Pere were often butting heads against each other. And he was the one who, you know, made the cobble skirt, right? Yeah. Which it was kind of a pretty controversial thing that she redesigned his hobble skirt yeah and that kind of started out their feud oh no and she also publicly criticized him for introducing what he called harem pants uh which she which she felt violated the decorum for women oh so she had her own little i think kind of conservative streak So Jeanne also had her design stolen a number of times, including once by a magazine that published photographs of her new designs before they were displayed. Oh. And she often would take these people to court, which I thought was great. (laughs) Yeah, you can't you can't do that. She even won a judgment once for 8000 francs against a fellow couture house. Oh, shit. Yikes. I don't know what 8,000 francs would be, but it was like 1912 or something. So, Lucas, if you have that number lying around, you could insert it here. <laughs> that would be $36,242. There were also a, there's like a significant issue with Americans copying French designs and replicating them. And that was exacerbated by the fact that America was still a very new country and they didn't have any copyright laws yet. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) So, nonetheless, Jean Pagillon was becoming a household name across the world. Obviously, she had these branches in all of these places. She was employing more than 2,000 people. And so in 1939, her most famous design came about. So there was a tango dance craze sweeping Paris. <laughs> and it was kind of like a risque, you know, because tango is pretty sexy. Yeah. And so she actually had tango dancers come into the studio and she watched them as they danced, making sure that the design she made would look great as it moved, but wouldn't expose the lady. Hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no crotch shots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no crotching coming out. Yeah, so she decided to layer to these layers of light chiffon under a tulle overskirt that had a tunic on top. So when that when they twirled, it would all rise and there'd be so many layers. Ooh. And she also implemented her famous pleats, like she did for the hobble skirt, into the tango skirt so that it would move very well. And this was one of her most celebrated designs, with women flocking to her couture shop to get their very own tango dress. And I, I can't, I can't, I think this is not a coincidence. This same year as she did this huge dress that everybody wanted, Jeanne Paquion was the first woman designer to be awarded the Légion d'Honneur, or however you say it, the, the honor, Legion of Honor Award, okay. oh. which is France's highest civilian yeah. award. That same year... Shareholders in the Pacquion brand received a 211% return on their investment. Whoa. 
And the That's New York Times shit ton. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. Because if you invested one single dollar, you got two hundred and eleven back. I mean, that's yeah. a great investment. So people who gave like maybe ten grand or, you know, five grand, oh they gosh. got a lot of fucking money back at yeah. the end of the year. And this is what the New York Times said about her. She maintains the attitude of an artist, but we know she is the most commercial artist alive. Mm. <laughs> Because that girl knew how to make those. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Just the that way money. that she opened her doors, the way that they ran their business, and especially her with her accessibility to designs. That's what people want. You know, and like she was so smart about the things she decided to design, too. Mm -hmm. You were going to say something else. I'm sorry. Well, it's like everybody would love an original piece that would cost thousands and thousands of dollars but not everybody can do that but no. to have a custom piece that is more accessible and also comfortable it's like i would rather have that yeah than a for sure fucking hobble skirt <laughs> that those hobble skirts are not even cute <laughs> they're not so <laughs> she's riding high right like everything is coming up pakion yeah <laughs> <laughs> in 1914, she decided to take her designs on the road. This was also something that Paul Poiré had done. So she started traveling with mannequins across the United States. She and her sister-in-law, who was her business partner at this time, they went on what they called the Cro Croissade de la Elegance, which is the Crusade of Elegance. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> they felt the United States needed it. Yeah. And they visited places like New York and Boston and Philly and Pittsburgh and Chicago. So all of those major cities in the East and, and Midwest. At first, they started charging $3 a ticket to enter to just look at the designs. Oh. And when they continued to sell out, they decided to raise the price to $5 <laughs> a ticket to get in. And they sold out every single show especially after it became known that her models were wearing pink wigs. Ooh, I love that. So I, I still want to know $5 a ticket. That would, that would still be a lot today. Like all you, you just pay $5 to go in and look at a design on a model or a mannequin. So Lucas, what would $5 a ticket from 1914 be today? $5 in 1914 is the equivalent of $129.28 today. Of course, this tour of her designs caused an even bigger issue with people in America copying them. I can imagine, yeah. You know, because they could come in and they could look at the garments and they could, you know, some people could remember it from memory and be able to mm -hmm. draw it. But there were even other issues, and this happened not just in her house, but in others as well, where disgruntled employees would copy the design or even steal the design and send it to Americans. Oh, geez, that's harsh. So, Paul Pore, her, like, nemesis, <laughs> <laughs> he decided to start a group to prevent this problem. So, all of these French designers got together, including Pacquion to try to stamp out this practice. But as they moved along in this, he was he was doing more and more things that were kind of outrageous to her. And she was like, fuck this, I'm out, you're crazy. Oh. And most of the designers followed her instead of staying with him. Which I think shows how much respect she had garnered, not, yeah. not just amongst clientele, but amongst other designers. Other, other designers, yeah, that's a big deal. And in fact, she was so well regarded by other Paris couture designers that they appointed her the president of what they called at the time the cha cha chamber. It was probably Chambre Syndicale de la Couture, which was the cha basically a chamber of commerce for only couture designers. Mm -hmm. It was the official organization of all Parisian couturiers in 1917, and they've appointed her president. She held that post in charge of all French couturiers for two years until 1919. She retired, Jean Pacquion retired from her house in 1920 when she was 51 years old. And she placed another woman in charge, Madeline Wallace, who was really great at furs. So she was a good fit. Okay. 
Jeanne Pankion died in 1936 when she was still quite young, only 67. Wow. That is really young. Yeah. It wasn't yours 66? 66. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they had pretty young lives, you know, to be cut short. After her death, her fashion house carried on for 20 more years, but eventually lost its competitive edge when new designers like Dior came on the market. Mm. The Paris House of Pacquion closed officially on July 1st, 1956. It was the first major fashion house started by a woman and whose head designer was a woman, and Pacquion was successful for nearly 50 years. Jeanne Pacquion was the first great woman couturier at a time when clothing for women was designed almost exclusively by men. She changed fashion to create more wearable, practical clothing that still looked beautiful and unique. She was also the first designer to have multiple branches of her line. When we talk of people like Coco Chanel and Diane von Furstenberg and Betsy mm-hmm. Johnson, we should also know the name Jean Pacquion who paved the way for each of them well before their time. That's really neat. Yeah. She had quite a stamp. I'm su- I'm sh- kind of shocked I don't know her name. Me too, because I follow a lot of fashion stuff. I'm not like terribly fashionable myself, but I like love fashion. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and I have never heard of her until now. No, me neither. So I'm, I'm glad that you enjoyed her story and... I really can't wait for people to see her her designs as well. Like this week, when we release our images, I want there to be tons of images. Because <laughs> I want to see all of your lady's paintings, and I want people to see all of Jean Pacquion's designs. You know, maybe what I might do is do one post for one and one post for the other so we can include more photos. Oh, that would be cool. That'd be really cool. Well, here's what I... Um, did for my resources so the place where i was showing you those pictures of her dresses that Mm -hmm. that came from a page that i didn't even know existed which is google arts and culture (laughs) okay i also use an article on blue 17 which is a fashion like it's like a place where you buy jeans in the uk but they had an article on her called successful women designers john pecchione there was a profile of her by Jan Glyer Reader on lovetoknow.com. And then uh, I took a little from Wikipedia, but the things that I used most were actually from real live books. <laughs> <laughs> That's neat. One was uh, a book called Clothing and Fashion, American Fashion from Head to, Do- Head to Toe by Jose Blanco. And then um, another one that I used was actually my primary one is called The Great Fashion Designers by Brenda Polin. And I found that on the Internet Archive. Hmm. Fascinating. I can't wait to... I want to see what she looks like. I'm going to look her up today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's... And she was very fashionable at the time. So that's in, it's interesting to take a look at her and like what she wore versus what she created. Yeah. And she was neat. Was the monkey fur really monkey fur? I think it must have been. Oh, I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> oh, anytime we talk about somebody using fur in this time, it was not ethical at all. <laughs> like, oh, it was geez. not good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's why people are so anti-fur is because a lot of that stuff back then was just so awful. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, I mean, they, uh, like when the Brits were colonizing India, they would, you know, have this rare quote-unquote rare exotic furs that they would get from India. And, oh, and wow. I think one of them was, in fact, monkeys. They Jeez. would do monkey fur and whatnot. That's interesting. Well, yeah. she did She did definitely think outside the box. She did. And, of course, like, I think we always have to also put everything in context. Like, obviously, we know more than she would have known then about ethical stuff yes <laughs> well, well i uh did you i hope you enjoyed that one i really liked her i did i really did and i'm the same way like i i enjoy fashion terribly but as i sit here in my hoodie and my husband's shorts i am not the most <laughs> fashion forward person yeah same i'm i'm wearing an old navy love winds tank top 
<laughs> yeah, like <laughs> with my with my old navy uh yoga pants that I've had for approximately 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we can't not... appreciate the the pretty the finer things. Well, I'm glad that you enjoyed it and I enjoyed hearing about your painter and remind me of her name once more. Uh Sarah Biffin. Sarah Biffin. That's right, Biffin. Well, everybody, thank you for listening. I hope you also enjoyed our two stories today. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate the listeners. And thank you to Lucas for editing our lovely little podcast. And also, uh, Lucas, good luck. (laughs) He is about to embark on a bike down the coast trip. And I'm really excited for you. And I hope you have a great time. And when we say bike, we mean bicycle. Yes. So So, good luck to Lucas. And we're excited for you. And uh, also, obviously, want to thank Jennifer Finch for our lovely theme music. Thank you for listening, guys. Till next time. <laughs>